Hello everyone, my name is Devin Thorpe and I'm a Forbes contrib contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing and I, I'm excited to have a, an extraordinary guest today with me. We have John Taft who is the CEO of RBC Wealth Management in the US. So John, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. It's just an honor to have you. My pleasure, Devin. It's interesting that you as the CEO of RBC Wealth Management and I as a Forbes contributor are here not to talk about wealth management. <laughs> and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk about something that I think is important to you and it's important to me. I think it's important to everyone and it's water. Uh, tomorrow is World Water Day. Uh, can you tell us why it is that RBC has decided to care about water so much? I'd be delighted to and let me start by by telling you what our commitment to water is. Uh, since 2007 uh, we have been working our way through a 50 million dollar commitment to uh, projects around the world that preserve and improve water quality. We were one of the first uh, corporate large corporations to focus a significant part of our, our giving on water quality. Now uh, the reason for that is both obvious and I think underappreciated and that is that water is one of our most precious planetary resources. I mean, next to the oxygen in the air, if you were to uh, remove water from the equation, I think most human beings would last only a few days. And there's this general impression, particularly in North America, that water is fresh water, clean water, drinkable, swimmable, usable water is a an infinite resource or a resource that isn't in, in trouble or jeopardized in any way and nothing could be further from the truth. So we're in the wealth management business. Wealth management is all about stewardship. Stewardship defined as responsibly managing what others have entrusted to your, our care uh, what is a more important stewardship undertaking than making sure we are managing and husbanding our water resources over the generations? And on that scale, we're not doing a very good job. You know, I love that word, stewardship, because it resonates with me at least as being a word that that really captures our responsibility for future generations and uh, the care that we should have for uh, our environment and especially this precious resource of water. Can you give us some examples of some of the projects that you've helped to fund over the last uh, seven years of this program and how it's helping or at least how it's intended to help? Yes, I w I, they fall into, first of all, it's a very diverse range of projects that we funded. And, and I will say that, that our focus has um, evolved over the course of this blue water commitment period uh, to where now for the last several years we are really focusing in on urban water resources uh, in part because obviously that's where you can affect the quality of life of the most people. Um, but I, I, last year, for example, I was at the uh, Baltimore Aquarium or the Maryland Aquarium uh, because we have given a, a substantial amount of money uh, to the uh, Chesapeake Bay, various Chesapeake Bay initiatives. I mean, it's an incredibly important water resource and about 15 million people live around, touch, uh, recreate, derive their food from, and, and otherwise uh, benefit from the water resource, and yet it is it is it is threatened would be not too strong a word by all kinds of pollution, the same kinds of pollution that affect any urban water resource. So uh, we gave money to that uh, to to the uh, aquarium and related entities to do what they can to clean up the bay. You know, another to the other end of the stream, we gave. We gave a grant to an organization that 
recruits, volunteer pilots, I think it's out of Wyoming, who take scientists and researchers and uh, environmentalists up in their planes and fly them around and let, let them do what everyone does, map, uh, uh, scout uh, uh, water resources from the air so that they can then, you know, plan initiatives or, 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 or address water resources. And then lastly, just a third example, we funded a 17,000 mile uh, bus trip through North America by uh, Alexandra Cousteau, the granddaughter of, uh, of Jacques Cousteau, where she went to a various uh, resources, including Mississippi River, the Colorado uh, uh, Delta, the Delta where the Colorado River used to flow into the uh, Pacific Ocean, but now that it's completely dry, the, the river never makes it to the ocean, to underground water passages in Toronto and so forth, documented all those visits, met with local experts, and then presented these documentaries around the country in order to bring awareness to the issue. I mean, the first step is to make people aware. The second step is to fund efforts to improve the situation. And, and so the, the grants have been very diverse uh, around, around the country, around North America, and quite frankly, around the world. So it really is, uh, you know, this remarkable breadth of things that you're doing, and it, it matches well with the scope of the problem. Uh, let me, just, let me just make, uh, make one other um, uh, point about what we've done that's been enormously successful and is sort of a, uh, a classic example of you know, one of the things always behind these initiatives, these corporate social responsibility initiatives, of why are you doing it? Why are you a profit-making corporation taking $15 million and giving it to a bunch of not-for-profit organizations to improve water quality? Ban last time I checked, banking was a wasn't a water intensive, you know, industry. So why are we doing that? Well, the perfect example of that is um, what we do every year. We we declare a day, uh, Blue Water Day, and this year it's it's June twelfth. And then in the United States, for example, we we go out to all of our branch offices. We have over two hundred in more than forty states, and we ask them to identify. Uh, a community makeover project, you know, maybe removing weeds from a from a stream uh, in in uh, in uh, an important local uh, stream that, th th uh, as we did here in Minneapolis, or helping to clean up the Mississippi River, and and then we ask the the employees in that office to volunteer to go and work, you know, get their hands dirty, literally, in, in remediating something that's, uh, that's threatening water quality in a local community. Well, guess what happens when that happens? Number one, the community benefits. They're appreciative. It improves our brand. Um, it identifies us as somebody who cares about the local community. But secondly, the other thing it does, it's a tremendous uh, activity when it comes to engaging employees. They love it. You know, kind of, if you think about it, they come to work and they use the same part of their brain every day working for RBC. Well, now they come to work and put on blue shirts on Blue Water Day. They jump on a van. They go out to the, you know, to the, to the river and they clean up trash from the river and they're doing it on behalf of RBC. It's, it seems to free up or exercise or connect another part of employees' brain. So it's been a tremendously... A successful enterprise. We had more than 2,700 employees involved in almost 200 community makeovers last year, and that's an example of classic example of where doing good actually helps us as an employer. Well, yeah, you can see the the benefit to to RBC in, in that context, the uh, and as well as to the communities. The employee engagement's got to be just uh, off the chart. It's got to help with. Uh, employee engagement over the long haul, not just the short term, I would imagine. Right. It does. And then the other the other thing which I, I think is a critical and as far as um, as I'm concerned, you don't read you don't read about it enough. A critical um, uh, motivator for corporate entities to engage in this kind of activity. And that is that you know the the old um, uh, Milton Friedman formulation that the only responsibility of a of 
of a firm is to its shareholders, make money for, to its shareholders. It just is it. It's doesn't ex, It's not a credible proposition anymore. You know, I think most people recognize that any corporation has multiple constituents: employees, clients, um, and the communities in which they live and work. Those are all important constituencies. But more than that, increasingly in the world today, if you are manufacturing a product or you are providing a service, you're not just competing on the basis of price. You're not just competing on the basis of service or product quality. You are competing in the marketplace for ideas and values. People want to do business with firms whose values align with theirs. Well, you know, I think that's a, 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 a brilliant point. Uh, I want to transition just a little bit this discussion to uh, the, the broader issues of water. As all of us face this problem. This isn't just an RBC problem, as you pointed out. Uh, this isn't just a problem for manufacturers. It's not a product. It's not a problem that's unique to any one uh, geography or socioeconomic class. Uh, we're all in this together, right? That's right. Well, and, and let me give you a couple of points around that. First of all, uh, there are a billion people, one billion people in the world today who do not have reliable access to water of the quality that sustains life. So that is a critical issue. Less than one percent of the water resources on the planet are of a quality that will sustain life. And then thirdly, it's, it's actually an interesting uh, um, intersection between uh, climate change or global warming and water quality is that increasingly um, the extreme weather we're experiencing is threatening water resources. Now, just recently, RBC conducted and just published a survey of Canadians' attitudes on water. And what they found was, because of some severe storms in Canada this, uh, this year, this past year, Canadians are highly aware, much more so than ever before, of the extreme weather risk or the, the increase in extreme weather. Well, why is that important to, to uh, water resources? Well, anytime you have a large storm, you know, a rainstorm or you know, a hurricane or whatever, what happens is you have a deluge of rainwater and so many of the sewage systems in the world handle are, are, are inadequately set up to, to process large flows of water. So you have storm sewers that collect rainwater and regular sewage pipes that are either the same or that overflow between the two. So when a lot of rain is running through storm sewers, it often tends to interfere with the processing of raw sewage and you get it either dumped into rivers or resources that shouldn't happen. I actually, more than 30 years ago, worked on a project that separated the storm sewers in St. Paul, Minnesota for exactly that reason. I financed it, designed it, and uh, saw it through its, its initial phases. That was a problem then, it's a problem now. Well, we've had flooding in Colorado in the last year. We had Superstorm Sandy. In both those cases, we had this sewage issue come up as a result of extreme weather. So. Extreme weather, climate change, water quality, they're all related. In addition to this you know, previous problem I mentioned, which is that vast numbers of people in the world don't have access to clean water. Well, uh, what is the, is there an opportunity for non-RBC people to make a difference in the water quality in their communities in the world, how would you want people to engage in this solution? Uh, in addition to becoming RBC customers, <laughs> well, we're delighted to, <laughs> to to have them become RBC customers. Thank you for mentioning that. But um, one one of the things we've learned in the course of the last seven seven years is how many 
engaged and committed organizations there are working on a local basis to address water quality issues. And so the first thing you can do is volunteer or support financially organizations that know a lot about the problems locally. And that's what we do with this, uh, this, this Blue Water Project. I mean, so far we've given $38 million to 650 organizations around the world. And last year, uh, we made a couple of, uh, of grant, larger grants to treat people, uh, which is in the city of Los Angeles, environmentally focused group, and then the Nature Conservancy of Minnesota. We gave them both $100,000, uh, $100, but then we took another $100,000 and spread it out over 19 different organizations locally around the U.S. So all you have to do is go on, you know, go on your search engine, you know, look for water quality uh, organizations locally and get involved. That's number one. The other thing is that there is, there's just, and, and get informed. There is too little awareness of water quality issues and concerns on the part of most people. There are so many resources right now. You can go out and you want to know what the weather's going to be locally. You just click on the weather.com. But are you going to the beach or you want to go, you know, you want to, you want to, uh, go for a canoe ride or, or do something else around uh, water quality. There's no place you can go today and click on it and say, okay, we got, we got bacteria in this water. We have a pollution problem last week over here. So local awareness on the part of consumer of, of water and users of water and then local involvement, those are the keys. It's, a, it's one of these examples of where local action means everything and will drive results faster and more effectively than anything else. It's an interesting perspective. I'm so glad you shared that because I don't know that it's obvious to people that when we talk about uh, global problems that the required action is local. It doesn't seem to me, didn't leap off the page at me at least, that the uh, solution to this global problem is right here in my backyard, in your backyard, and in the next guy's backyard. That's, that's a great insight. Thank you. So, uh, John, I really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us today. Uh, I commend you for the good work you're doing. Uh, you've got some a, a little bit of money left. Uh, I suspect there are organizations who will be interested in getting a piece of that. Uh, if someone wa had a project, they wanted to uh, tap into the resources that are available, how do they apply? How do they become part of the program? Well, we obviously we have um, I think website resources that you can go to. You know, just again, I I, I don't I don't have that information right in front of me, but okay. you can go on on your search engine and look for RBC Blue Water Project, and that should have we do have a formal grant uh, review submission submission review and selection process, and that should walk you through it. Great, great. Uh, I John, really appreciate your time today. Thank you for being here and uh, uh, hope you'll keep us posted on your uh, progress as you uh, wrap up the final pieces of this commitment. Absolutely. Well, although the money in that fund is close to being spent, the commitment we've uh, engendered among our employees on, for water quality will continue for years to come. And of course, that's exactly the point. So thank you for uh, giving me the chance to talk about this critically important project today, Devin. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Now uh, let's do some good. <laughs>